through. So according to our schedule, we're ready to begin. Um, so in our perilous times, I'd love to welcome you all to this joyous moment. Uh, the celebration of the publication of Professor Adrian de Leon's book of poetry, Barangay. He'll be in conversation with the renowned Chamorro poet and scholar, Professor Craig Santos Perez. Uh, my name is Doreen Kondo, Professor of American Studies and Anthropology. Um, I'm also a playwright and dramaturg. Adrian and I co-founded the Creativity Theory Politics Cluster in ACE that centers around the transformation of knowledge through our engagement with bodies, the sensorium, and the arts. We seek to change the air of the academy in a collective project of decolonization. Please join us as we explore rigorous fun and serious play in our encounters with scholar artists as in today's discussion and by engaging in artistic and scholarly workshops, making and creating together. We assume the cultural, artistic, and theoretical to be inextricable from the political, and interventions in these arenas offer ways to shift power relations. Uh, we've posted a link uh, to our website where people can find out more about our upcoming activities. This year, our theme is collaboration, and in this event, we're collaborating with the Trans-Pacific Research Cluster and especially the East Asian Studies Center, who so generously provided funding, posted for the event and is hosting um, this event space. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like at this point to introduce Lea Villarreal, member of our CTP Collective, who's an avant-garde composer. She'll be spending the summer at Guildhall School of Music in London, very exciting. Um, and she's a candidate for a doctorate in musical arts in the Thornton School. And she will introduce our panelists or two speakers today. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Kondo, and welcome everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to add to these chorus of welcomes for our event today and celebrating historian, poet, and multimedia educator Adrian De Leon and his latest work, Berengue, an offshore poem. Uh, we're so fortunate to have him here at USC as an assistant professor of American Studies and Ethnicity with affiliations for the Center for Trans-Pacific Studies, the East Asian Studies Center, and the Equity Research Institute. Together with Professor Kondo, Adrian is the co-founder and co-convener of the aforementioned transdisciplinary research cluster, Creativity Theory and Politics. De Leon's research and commentary have appeared in venues such as the Los Angeles Times, National Geographic, The Conversation, Vice, ABC Nightline, and Rolling Stone, and The Guardian. Berengue has been hailed as indelible and subversive and gorgeous by Kathy Park Hong and a wondrous feat of both imagination and political solidarity by Billy Ray Belcourt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Berengue was named as one of the CBC Books Best Canadian Poetry Collections of 2021, and we are thrilled to welcome not only Dr. De Leon to speak on this work, but to invite Dr. Craig Santos Perez to lead the conversation. Craig is an indigenous Chamorro from the Pacific island of Guam. He is a poet, scholar, editor, publisher, essayist, critic, book reviewer, artist, poet, scholar, <laughs> and political activist, environmentalist, and so much more. He is affiliate faculty with the Center for Pacific Island Studies and at the Indigenous Politics Program. He is also the co-founder of A La Presse, the only publisher in the U.S. wholly dedicated to, to Pacific literature. And our cluster is invigorated by the presence of scholar artists such as Adrian and Craig, and we're thrilled to support, be inspired by, and to make space for thinkers who are blurring boundaries. Um, so if there are no further introductions, please jump in if there are, my uh, distinguished uh, panel. But with that, we welcome both Craig and Adrian to our digital stage for this afternoon's event. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with a few poems, and then we're going to kick off the conversation between myself and Craig, which I think is also a bit of a catch up, a bit of a currents meeting, shorelines meeting, boats meeting the uh, seas of islands meeting and converging as well. I'm gonna start with the poem, An American Delusion. When America frees you from Soleimani, you Saigon jungle people who scurry from your boondocks will welcome the liberators of Guam from the Spanish clutches around your Caribbean island. 
Rest easy, little brown brothers, for America is here to frack every gook rallying from the sand against First Secretary Hussein, no comrade of yours. You will shout freedom from camp towns built to protect you from the supreme leader of North San Salvador, keeping you stale so that you can gather bananas and maintain our America abroad so that one day you can unearth each finger to frack that liquid black gift of freedom. The next two, I don't have titles for them, but I call them wake poems, and they're done um, in conversation with um, and in the wake of the work of the formidable Christina Sharp at York University. In the Salish Sea, our clock flickers from the wake. When a blaze breaks the lavender, we call the embers morning, a wrestle between desperate ray and relentless cloud. We name their romp the afternoon. If amber blinds the retina, we bid good night to the sun. If ice seems to shimmer in waves as above, we greet the night. The stern germinates into the earth, branching timelines like cedars, evergreening into the shore. Can we burn the water's waxy leaves into necessary medicine? Will we breathe its smoke until our memory scars over? Or will our time be denied from us until the shoal beds the dead into the grains of the hourglass? Second, once Barangay sighed along the Pasig, where reeds shook in the wake, where shanty shores now stilt, wet stone bolos waded through billowing fish. Once Pasig churched from the same gasps that stretched these sails. Once Mangatala pooled to sweep us here. And then two more I will end this first reading with, but also to introduce um, on my conversation with Craig, but number two, some of the work that um, the book is trying to do, which is on one hand, discrete pieces, but also a continuous poem. And one of the forms that I try to bring in from Ilocano traditions in this piece or in this book is the Dung Ao as a morning poem and as a morning chant from the Ilocano diaspora. And the Dung Ao, unlike the, the sort of, you know, um, private enclosed uh, spaces of grief um, that we experience under colonialism and imperialism. The Dung Ao is a collective grief. It's, 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 it's a chant that begins with the one closest um, to the deceased and then echoes and then becomes added on like a cipher until it echoes and ripples across the entire village. And I wanted to bring this work um, as I rewrote this book during the pandemic and what does it mean, not just one to bring um, people ashore and aboard the barangay, but number two, to have a dung ao across the unmourned dead of empire and capital. So there are several pieces and I'll read two before the conversation. Dung ao to Guangdong brethren at Promontory Point, Utah, 1869. Belabored brothers, when you hammered each railroad stake into the earth, did you hear them wail at their reunion with Shoshone blood? Did the soot sit unmourned? Did your femurs rattle the kindred chorus rearranging bones beneath you? Did you strike the first notes of the requiem we call the Americas? Dung Ao after Sadia Hartman. This mortuary marooned into dewy decimals, a last glimpse of persons about to disappear into the slavehold. To these halls, professional gatekeepers, each body corresponds to a line in the catalog, each rib a folder among the femurs plundered from the hoard, what bones wreck beneath. Spine against spine, shelved on ancient wood and garden marble, I saw a grave. But no epitaphs except ethnologies, no lifespans listed except the date of acquisition. Here is the shoreline of the famished cemetery. Here are the waves of the slaughterhouse. Here our archives in the stars. All right, thank you. So I just wanna welcome um, colleague, someone I consider a mentor, someone I admire very much, 
um, and friend and fellow oceanic writer, Craig Santos Perez. Um, and why, besides obviously um, the fact that I wanted to, you know, be in conversation with you for a long time, one of the reasons why I wanted to welcome you here was that I wanted to thank you. Um, the form and the shape and the wake work of this book um, really emerged because of a poem that you read at the University of San Francisco on April 2018th when I first saw you perform. And that was the poem Off Island Chamorros, which should be familiar to some folks. He ends with, um, home is an archipelago of belonging. And that resonated with me precisely because I had been trying to figure out what to do in the Filipino diaspora uh, um, as someone who wanted to write through the grief of losing my grandmother just two months before, three months before. And the sort of language that your work, your oceanic work, your archipelagic work um, gave that process as something that is a poetics and a thinking that I'm really indebted to. And for that, I'm grateful for your work. I'm also grateful for your blurb and for reading and for having the book, which everyone can purchase wherever books are available, preferably um, from your independent bookstore. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Adrian, for, for having me, for the invitation, for that beautiful and, and profound reading you just gave. I, I'm so happy that our, our diasporic canoes have yeah. crossed paths again here in, in virtual space. Um, you know, it was great seeing you in, in, in the Bay Area many years ago. And, you know, so wonderful and makes me so happy to see that you found a good home uh, down there at, at USC. And so, you know, thank you to, to everyone at um, your university for creating this space and, and for bringing us into conversation. Congratulations, my book arrived yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> From Canada. Own, yes, made its own journey um, across the continent and the ocean here to Hawaii. It's just a, such a beautiful book to hold. Obviously, I read it in uh, the proof form when I wrote the blurb, but your publisher did such an amazing job creating this, this beautiful carved, it feels like uh, yeah. uh, book objects. So I wonder if you could just start with, with telling us a little bit about the publisher and how folks can order this book and, and get it in, into their hands as well. Yeah, so the publisher um, are good folks named Buck Rider Books, who, which is an imprint under Woolsack and Wind, which is really one of the fine, um, long-standing 30 plus year independent presses in Canada. But why I wanted to publish with them was specifically to work with, sorry, one dark, was specifically to work with um, a poet named Canicia Lubrin. Uh, this was, this was um, she is a St. Lucian poet, uh, very much writes in the tradition of the Caribbean, writes in the tradition of the ocean, in the sea, in the island, um, in the transatlantic context, obviously, but um, she had been working on a project called the Dysgraphist, which has since won many, many, many accolades, including the Griffin Poetry Prize uh, last year. But I wanted to work with her because I saw in her work, and I think she saw in my work, the sort of the sort of crackles of a kinship between our different island contexts and she wrote um you know she writes about about decolonial future she writes about ruin she writes from the rhythm of calypso the rhythm of 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 reggae right the rhythm of dance hall the rhythm of the local creoles and the local rhythms and music of the islands and one of the things that she really encouraged me to do as part of the editorial process was to pursue that what does it mean to create a different language, a different vernacular and a different rhythm? Um, one that you have to piece together out of survival and out of grief and out of mourning, um, but also one that can offer, um, you know, new rubrics and new vocabularies um, to articulate the diasporic condition. So they were, they were really great to work with. She's now at McClellan and Stewart, um, but they continue to run a really, really, really wonderful program out there. Beautiful, well, congrats to, to the press as well for, for publishing such a great work. And you know, I, you know, since the, there's a, a Caribbean connection as well, and so much of this work uh, is grounded in, in islands and archipelagos and, and transoceanic spaces, uh, maybe I wanted to ask a question related to that, especially because I see it not only embodied in, in the content of these poems, but also in, in so much of the formal elements and how you uh, navigate the space of the page. So I'm wondering if you could just uh, talk us through some of the 
the formal visual elements of the book and how you think about um, you know that space and and the arrangement of words on the page. Absolutely. Um, I think the first draft of the book, I was being very safe, partly too because the the safety of there were a lot of sonnets. Um, so you would have seen a lot of sonnets, perhaps if I went with a different editor or a different publisher. Um, part of why I wanted to work with Kinesia as well. And so one of the things that we really wanted to work with was, was what does it mean to not just visually scatter, but sonically scatter, right? Because we, we and especially as someone who's read a lot of your work, a lot of Caribbean work, Araceli Skirmay, right? Nubrisay Philip, um, Dion Brandon, those kinds of poets, especially in her book, Thirsty. Um, I know what it's like, and I know what it means to, to write in the visual tradition. That is scattered, but I really wanted to situate this in a in a transoceanic and the Caribbean Pacific Southeast Asia conversation. Specifically, what does it mean to sonically scatter? What does it mean to perhaps deter the easy listen by either scattering people across different linguistic contexts? You know, bringing in Spanish, French, Tagalog, and Ilocano, especially, um, which I which I relearned and I learned um, really in Hawaii at the UH program when I was there. Um, and so on one hand, it's, it's one thing I was investing in is a sort of visual scattering. But number two, I wanted to disorient the reader. And I wanted to disorient the reader specifically by first and foremost, tossing away what it means to have a table of contents, right? And so I think you saw the table of contents yeah, is actually, yeah, is a picture of, of the Iloko shores. And you can see Barangay in the background, right? And so um, I've never actually really talked to most people who have read the book and encountered like, you know, the sort of affective, the affective structure of the book. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts, but also um, delaying translation, right? Edging towards translation, creating the sort of, you know, the sort of affective erotics towards which we can not just sat find ourselves satisfied by the eventual translation, but upend what it means to make sense, make sense of a dice work and scattered condition. And so I finally have a sort of legend in the background, right? Which sort of advances the book as, as, as a sort of oceanic boat riverine um, maritime form. But yeah, I wanted people to feel lost, as lost as the people who were scattered around the world and across the Pacific and find, you know, find different ways to like navigate it, which you're familiar with, you know, in the page and the stars. Yeah. I've, I've written before how, how form is a, a navigation of content. And I feel that very yeah. much, you know, throughout this book and definitely the yeah. first from the table contents, <laughs> turn the page and there's no table contents. You, we're just launched into this journey of yeah. the text. Um, and like you said, many uh, many of the words are, are not translated in, until the very end with the legend, but even the legend itself is uh, asterisks for the time being, as you yeah. put it. So there's this interesting sense of, of space and time that, that the poems navigate. Um, and you know, like you mentioned too, going through these pages, there's a real um, archipelagic geopoetics that I really felt, um, you know, taking us through these different island spaces, uh, you know, feeling the words as islands, and you know, the the image and symbol of of the outrigger canoe coming in and out of focus, taking us onto the shores, into the deep waters, uh, against the shoals, and and so on, and so. You know, you mentioned several uh, Black diasporic writers, and so I'm wondering maybe if you could dig in more into your sense of of articulating a, a diasporic poetics in this yeah. work, of course, influenced by other uh, diasporic writers as well. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think one of the the things I found inspiring about archipelagic writing, oceanic and island writing, is that it's not just about the islands, right? It's about the seas of islands, the spaces, right? The spaces between the channels and, and, and the fjords in between. And in some ways, they're, especially as someone who writes in like Asian American history, Asian American studies, and that sort of um, intellectual tradition, there's an underlying insistence about the terrestriality of our people moving across around and around the world. You wrote this in that short piece, the Terrapelago, the Imperial Terrapelago, and what does it mean to write against it and across it and recognize the, the movements between land and sea, or, you know, as Tiffany Lothalbo King calls it, the shoals, right? In her case, the Black Shoals. And 
what was important to me was to think about what does Filipino community, um, community making, genealogy making, identity, if you want to call it sort of tentatively, what does it mean to toss that into, into the sea, particularly because in a pre-colonial, early colonial, colonial contemporary context, right, many people from the Philippine diaspora continue to make contact with the sea and the river, whether that's working on ships, right, um, staring at the ocean as, as they fly to their places of work and often forced labor and coerced labor, um, or their memories, right? In this case, I have um, a series of poems about um, memories of rivers and my father's memories of the rivers that are now gone and, and, and rivers that are now poisoned or, or are now just reduced to sort of rubble or trickle. And so I wanted to think about what it means to destabilize this formation we call Filipino community making and destabilize the role of the metropole, which is Manila, right? destabilize the role of land, like terrestrial land specifically, and really bring you know, conversations on land in conversation with so much of the life making that happens at sea. That's so powerful. And you know, remind me a couple of things that you wrote about as well, especially your, your acknowledgments are, are really beautiful. As additionally- What did I even write? Um. <laughs> There was one oh, yeah. you put, you know, to everyone who builds this boat with me, and you mentioned the various places you live, people yeah. in different communities. Um, to us, dear readers, for setting sail with you. Um, you know, there's another point we talk about. You know, everyone for for kind of every community is like this barangay, this canoe, yeah. this community, which I found really beautiful, and feeling like these poems also carry that. Uh, community with you, those memories, uh, various kinds of, of archives as well. And, you know, and, and of course, the, the silences of the archives you mentioned about the river, this poem, if I could try to show it. <laughs> do we remember, like, is it the how do we remember a river buried? Yeah, that one? The yeah, visual, the visual and it's just, that yeah. was a really striking moment in, in the book as well. Um, you know, and just you know, think about how we navigate those those memories, those archives, what is lost, um, you know, our, our genealogies of, of dispossession and, and dispersion and, and forgetting and, yeah. you know, being in the wake of all of those traumas, the way you capture that through, you know, these really lyrical um, poems that, you know, are, have a kind of narrative, um, Kind of journey to them as well, but there's the even like the the silences and the blank spaces on the page are, are so they have a density to them um, that that I think is true for for oceanic uh, poetry in general. Thinking about you know the ocean as not being a blank or empty space, but really? having rich histories and and all kinds of complex uh, aqua politics that I feel like you capture in ways that are, are really, you know, fragmented, but uh, also very compelling. And so, you know, with that said, I'm, I was also drawn so much to the morning of this poem. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, as you mentioned, the kind of the impetus of the book, um, you know, uh, of, of mourning your, your grandmother's passing. And, and I feel like you do so much to honor, not only her, but many, many family members in this book. And so I wonder if you could just talk about how, you know, the, the book as, as a, a morning song, as a wake, but also as a, a way to honor, honor the ancestors and, and elders. Thank you for that question. Um, I think to kind of synthesize it with something you said earlier, right, which is thinking about um, not just the gravity of the spaces between, right, um, the, as a way to you know, map a different geopoetics and geopolitics of the ocean, which is often seen by empire as a blank slate. Um, I also wanted to think about the sort of role that people from, you know, the Philippines, Austronesia, Polynesia, Micronesia, Melanesia have as people who build boats and come from that tradition, right? We know that, we know that really well. And, and we know the sort of importance it is for our genealogies and our peoples, you and myself included, to return to navigating 
through the currents, but also the stars. But at the same time too, right? Like, and especially this is my sort of more direct intervention against and to the Filipino diaspora, that building that boat can't be an atavism. It can't be a return to a pre-colonial past. It can't be a nostalgia, right? Boats like ships, these vessels carry violent histories, right? Of enslavement, of, of warfare, of genocide, of munitions, of pollution, right? Of, 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 of poisoning, um, even as they carry the sort of decolonial potential of life giving. And so I wanted to, that's, that was a sort of transhistorical argument that the piece and the book itself was trying to do, which was, you know, what does it mean to build these boats and build these boats and, and, and bring people aboard in maybe tentative ways, right? In ways that hold our own histories and our own decolonial possibilities from our side of the ocean accountable to other oceans and the deep violences that the other oceans have brought in those violent imperial histories. And that to me is really where the work of mourning starts, right? Um, I see both the boat, like the Dung Ao, like um, the, the, the very blatant and the very, very direct cross citations of different poets and scholars and writers across this book as a way of trying to imagine mourning with and, and place both my, my own personal process of mourning, my grandmother, my grandmother's, um, my, my paternal grandmother, who, who's, whose death launched this book as well, my maternal grandmother's sister, COVID-19, right? Like Filipino, Filipino deaths, especially among nurses and care workers on the front lines in early 2020. And what, but what does it mean to mourn with? What does it mean to imagine a mourning that does not isolate, but rather like a Dung Ao echoes and chants and recursively builds until it becomes this repetitive, this um, complex, this collectively built poem slash barangay that echoes across the barangay, which is the village as well, right? And so one of the, the sort of, I guess, geographical insights that that led me to was initially I had thought, all right, I'm gonna write about the ocean, the boat in the ocean and write across oceans. But it led me to rivers and estuaries and tributaries. It led me to my hometown of Scarborough, right? Which is which is an in Anishinaabe Moen, um, uh, Lake Ontario is called uh, the leading sea, right? And, and the way that it leads out to the leading sea is through this incredible estuary of rivers that flows in from inland um, upon which um, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people um, portage on canoes going up the river. And now that is both um, settler space, but also deeply black indigenous and racialized space, right? Under duress, under nuclear nuclear, nuclear pollution, um, under many carcinogenics, right? As, the, as, the, as this place that is sort of the refuse of empire and capital in Canada. And yet so many of us who live in Scarborough come from island contexts, Caribbean contexts, Filipino context, right? Um, Indian Ocean context as well. The Tamil diaspora too, right? Is one I wanted to be in conversation with and doing this work. And so it brought me to rivers, it brought me to lakes and it brought me towards the sort of, not just like sort of transoceanic, but you know, this riverine politics as well. And I wanna cultivate that. I don't think I'm done. I don't think I'm quite done with it yet, right? Um, as much as I, 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 I do love the ocean and the coast and I miss like my homeland dearly, I wanna, I wanna think about these rivers and these rivers long buried, because even if they're buried then they're disappeared, we feel them, they haunt us, right? Like where I went to school in the University of Toronto, you can walk on this place called the Philosopher's Rock and that is a river buried. And the, and the ground still like is mushy, right? As if it's a sort of way to say, it's kind of like Waikiki, right? As if it's a sort of way to say, hey, we're still here, it's still here, right? You can't, you can't completely wipe out this geography completely. Like it's 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 a haunting, and it's one I want to really think about. Uh, it made me think of um, uh, some of Rita Wong's work. We just read some of her work in my my eco poetry awesome. class, and just thinking about water and rivers, and and you know her her work seems to be we could bring into dialogue in productive ways. I, I think with, with your work as well. Um, but you know, along those lines, the section tributaries, which I love in this book as well. Uh, has a different form than, than the other poems, right. uh, more of a block prose poetry style. So I wonder if you could tell us about that formal choice in, in that section. So this um, section used to be called translations. Oh. And it used to be sort of these coy ways to continue to defer 
and delay translation, both both in terms of providing you know complicated histories um, that really speak to like the sort of affect of the genealogical structure behind Barangay, for example, right? But like insert personal histories and the way that I would define them. At times, they're incredibly erotic, right? There's this there's this one poem called On Denial, and it starts, for you, translation is my gift. I edge you to meaning, perch you against the rumbling waterfall with the patience of my tongue. String your moaning, por favor, right? And so, uh, yeah, slaps. <laughs> <laughs> Read it again. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, let me finish it. Um, okay, let me do it. Let me do it. You know what? This one's a, this one's a fun one. It always gets, like, people sort of worked up. When, especially when I'm reading in like white Canadian spaces, it's super fun. <laughs> They're like, whoa, oh my. Anyway, on denial. For you, translation is my gift. I edge you to meaning, perch you against the rumbling waterfall with the patience of my tongue. String your moaning, por favor. I cuffed your wrists from the dictionary's aid, if not my mouth, just the page into your ear until you come upon it dazzling. <laughs> it used to be longer and I thank uh, my editor for really kind of distilling it and in some ways making it raunchier as well too right <laughs> but in but in a sort of way like um one of the novelists that I'm really inspired by is Gina Apostol the Filipino novelist who I think now lives in Boston or works in Boston um and her first book which is only published in the Philippines just came out um forgetting what it's called off the top of my head do you know it's not gun dealer's daughter it's um bibliophile bibliolepsy bibliolepsy and she was writing her like her her protagonist is a young woman during the marcos regime who instead of joining the revolution has very very progressive politics but instead of joining the revolution wants just to read and sleep with novelists <laughs> Right. And the way that she described it, what I th was, I think, really amazing was that, you know, we we often think about revolution and liberation in sort of masculinist ways. Right. Rank and file, get in line and overthrow you know, the system. But you need to build a desire. You need to build a revolutionary structure of feeling that is dependent upon a sort of like politics of erotics. Right. How do you desire and how do you how do you continue to find the energy and the collective energy and movement to push and edge your way towards freedom? And liberation. And I think in subverting, number one, both the politics of translation that I was trying to advance in this book, but number two, again, launching that into C and, and remembering too that, that the C is as illegible as empire tries to make it legible through geography, through, through science, et cetera. Um, the translation doesn't provide final answers. And when translation does happen, um, how is translation also a sort of historical encounter? Right. What different kinds of meanings does 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 the barangay, for example, hold for people in the past or hold for, you know, um, Filipino migrant workers in Hong Kong and Dubai. Right. These these desert spaces as well. Right. Um, and that translation is never a one to one. Right. And translation always flows and moves and is tentative, um, is erotic at times, um, is unsatisfying at times as well so yeah it used to be called translations and then it just kind of made sense to sort of you know advance the geography of the book to think about translations as this like you know halted flow that that literally opens into the mouth of the sea yes the thing about like the tributaries between between languages as well absolutely the tributaries between different you know possible meanings and and allusions and so on um well, then maybe since we're talking about desire and the erotic, maybe we could push that further and, and be curious to how you think about, you know, desire and form or desire and, and the archive or desire mm -hmm. and memory. Because uh, I feel like, you know, that's a current that flows through this book that, you know, mm -hmm. comes to the surface, uh, so to speak, at, at certain parts is more obvious, like the one you read. But, uh, you know, I'm definitely curious as to yeah. how that is part of your craft as well. There's um one of the things that I that one of my major takeaways among many from Sadia Hartman's Lose Your Mother, right, is the sort of unsatisfying return migration, right? That no matter how 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 much you sift through the sort of um 
you know, the archives of the past and try to stitch a try to stitch a neat history into the present that you always have to fabulate, especially for archives and peoples and histories that have been obliterated materially by empire. But also at the same time, um, I wanted to think through what it meant for me to make the return migration to the Philippines for the first time after leaving. I was 16 when I saw that river be a trickle for the first time. And I was fascinated with this river. In some ways, I had built a sort of oral archive in my family about this river that involved, you know, my father's stories about circumcision, right? Like that's a real thing, right? Like in, in the provinces, right? Like um, your coming of age was to go and be circumcised by quack doctors who feed you guava leaves, right? In order to like numb the pain. It's, it, yeah, it's intense, right? But he'll, he'll, he'll tell these stories and these are stories also familiar, right? For, from, from fathers to sons um, in, the, in, in Filipino communities. But he would always talk about the river, and it wasn't it wasn't the sort of you know buildings romance of those of those folk of those folk tales that would get me. But it was it was I wanted to touch the river. I wanted to, you know, swim away from the leeches, and so I decided I would get really good at swimming, and I would swim that river one day. Um, I wanted to, you know, he always he always talked about um, diving down from the overpass, and he said, you know, he'll take us he'll take us when we when we go back and. You can dive into the river from the overpass and um, he would do that with his friends because the river was like really deep as much as it was very narrow. And then the closer we got to that trip, right, I found I found I found other sort of, you know, rivers laden with history the Basig River where my mother grew up. Um, now, not not a trickle, but brown and polluted, right, especially after the Marcos regime. Um, I took that channel through other rivers, right? When I used to live next to the St. Lawrence River um, in Quebec, right? Um, the Rouge River in my hometown. And then when I finally reached that river, my father was talking, but it was as if these archives could not reach their denouement, right? Like this, these archives could not translate into material history. And they compel you to like think of this other history that completely, not, not contradicts, but puts into a sort of violent context um, the sort of histories that 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 came from family memory and oral history, right? And so it was it was a brown trickle. And as I was doing research for this for this um, for this piece, you know, just upstream, um, nuclear power plants, um, Subic Bay, right? The naval the 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 huge naval base in the Philippines, um, all hoarding these resources and these forms of irrigation that are life giving and life sustaining to people in the Bataan Peninsula, and are now. A, not gone, right? Now hunt, right? And in, in, in their sort of absence. And one day I want to go back there and I want to think, and I just want to look, actually spend time looking at that river and smelling it, right? And 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 try to see, you know, what what sort of past can 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 you know memory and poetics reanimate in these rivers that are supposedly long gone. And in my hometown, Toronto, there are many, right? But like I said before, they continue to hunt. And so for me, I find counter histories in the sea, in the river, in the riverbed, in the shoreline, the ones that have disappeared. And as a historian trained in, you know, sort of the sort of false sense of empiricism, right? It's, 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 it's a sort of, it's a sort of counter history, but it's a sort of, it's a sort of violation of the profession itself too, right? As, as people who have been trained in disciplines, but I enjoy that. I enjoy that insurgency and I enjoy that insurgency because the land and the water too are insurgent and we need to honor that practice. So brilliant. And you know, thinking of, of this cluster talking about creativity yeah. and theory, and you mentioned your you know, your academic training. I'm just wondering if you have any advice for, for um, other poet scholars in the Zoom room about how how do you do both of these things? <laughs> how do you balance, you know, the, the scholarship and, and the poetry? How do you maintain that creative edge amidst the you know the empirical uh, demands of the discipline and, and so on what, what kind of advice can you give us i mean um i know there are like um undergraduate and graduate students also asking these same questions i know y'all can like type in the q a if you agree as well um for the feedback um would definitely help me feel less lonely no i'm joking um the first thing that helps is great colleagues right i i really lucked out when um i got it was a random Saturday morning and I got the job offer from this apartment, right, in, in, in the, the winter of 2019. 
And I realized, oh my gosh, like I was, I was trying to, I was, I was being so trained and disciplined to try to pursue and really value like a disciplinary job and be, and, and, and I went this whole poem or not this whole poem, this whole period where I was trying to write articles that were legible to the history discipline to try to end up in a history department. And I would do this on the side. And I knew I was always going to do this, but I did it in graduate school and um, where I stayed at home, like so stubbornly, right? Like I would, you know, do the academic thing and then I would commute east back to Scarborough and I would hang out with my friends. We're all writers, right? And we just kind of do our thing out there. But I could never kind of bring them together. And so on one hand, great colleagues really help and great students and great mentors, um, great fellow faculty who are really invested in doing this other kind of work. Secondly, I think I need to do creative writing as I'm doing historical writing. Um, you know, especially, you know, especially for people, you know, with, with genealogies under colonization, encountering the archive and encountering the history is encountering violence, right? The rebel of history behind the angel of history that Walter Benjamin talks about. It's processes of grief, right? It's mourning, it's traumatic at times. When you, when you turn the page and you get, and you land across a document and you interpret and you see what's actually going on, right? Um, entire genocides wiped out by the abstraction of colonial officials and the archives they left behind, right? Um, Microviolences, right? Um, usurpations of justice under imperialism, right? These kinds of things are traumatic because they're like, you can't be removed from them, right? And so I wrote the first draft of this book, which is drastically different, but I wrote the first draft of this book as the shadow dissertation, right? It's like that thing you do on the side, like while you're in grad school, while they're trying to tell you to do a more like formal dissertation, you know, I'm like, okay, but I got this other thing too. I know you all don't care, but this is really important to me. And so I'm really glad to be in a space where it is important to people and that can be a little more, you know, open, but also but also hopefully trying to make it easier for students and, and other folks trying to do this work that it's not just okay, but it's, it's necessary, it's life-giving to be doing creative work in and out of these spaces, these alienating spaces like the academy, like, like our other jobs across industries. Well, thank you for, for sharing that advice um, with all I mean, of us. I mean, that's you too, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the things that you were trying to, you're trying to really come up and try to, and try to, you know, model for people after too. And I think a lot of us take your cue, right? Just insisting on, on being, being a deeply creative, but also, you know, community invested in activist person through your work and your craft. For sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, makes me for my last question before yeah. we can get to hear some more of your poems. Um, you know, just just on that note, just thinking about about joy and, and love as well. And you know, we talked about the erotics and pleasure, but you know, there's also a, a kundiman in, in this book, and, and you know, so many moments of of connection, joyful yeah. connection and community. So I'm just, you know, for my last question, if you could just share a little bit about that importance of bringing those love songs as yeah. well as perhaps maybe a cross current or an undercurrent to, to some of the, the mourning and, and other um, deep, deep emotions. Yeah, no, thank you for that. There's, there's, there's the one piece which I'll read later called, called Kundiman, right? Which for people in the audience not familiar, it's, it's, it's a Gala word for love songs, not just love poems, but like love songs and love chants delivered very much like old Spanish ballads. And they're really beautiful to listen to um, and, and, and to be serenaded by and to serenade, right? Um, and in some ways, right, like the one, one, of the, one of the powerful things that I think was liberatory about writing a book slash a long poem that, that was really invested in the politics of a morning with is that in trying to reach across and to rearticulate, you know, forms of genealogy, forms of solidarity, forms of community, across otherwise individualizing structures of feeling of grief under capital, it opened up the possibility of being able to write from a place of love despite pain, right? And so in some ways it, writing this piece, you know, helped me reconcile with my family's history. It helped me, you know, very directly, it helped me mourn the fact that I had to leave home to find a job Right. Um, and it was it's as we know, like for anyone like, you know, finding home elsewhere, um, it is really difficult. 
to trans to transition to a new place and find your people. And I finally found my people, right? But in some ways, one of the things we don't like to acknowledge, especially on the tenure track, we're we're just supposed to kind of hit the ground running and figure it out, is that you know there's a long process, maybe a lifelong process of grief, too, right? And so how do you honor those those hometown as well as like you know, home island traditions, home province traditions, um, and, and genealogies and, and connections and kinships that you made. And so a lot of this piece, as well as the acknowledgements, which, which I'm really glad like um, you took to, um, is about just me missing my friends and my family and my hometown, right? A lot of them are in the audience. So I really appreciate y'all um, all the way from Toronto. Um, but yeah, I'd like to be able to like really process for myself in, in, in the myriad languages of the diaspora, um, what it means to miss people and love people and miss people that have passed or miss people who have passed on different journeys, right? And it might be a very long time until we converge again. So in some ways, yeah, this is, this is a sort of poem of longing and of anticipating when we'll meet again. Beautiful, thank you so much. Thank for you for being in conversation with me. Congrats on get, again on this beautiful book, for, for finding a, a home cluster down at, at USC. And- Absolutely. You know, just really, really grateful and honored to, to be able to dive into this book a little bit with you today. And now I'm gonna, you know, just sit back and enjoy the, the rest of the poetry reading. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Um, I am, because this was such a warm conversation, I am going to read a poem entirely in Ilocano and translate it for you folks. Um, so there's, there's a series of poems called Barangay Noun, and they offer these sort of proximate translations, non-translations, unruly translations to try to theorize what, what the boat really is all about. Barangay Innam. Ti barangay mi at sa o kan da ubing ni Amianan kan da Cordillera ni Cagayan kan Jay Isabela. Makaawatan mi, dagiti, pakras sa dimno, makasin na bat kami. Now we'll translate. And the translation is the very last piece in the book, which is the hint. Six. Our barangay. Speak with the children, the north, the mountains, Cagayan, Isabela understand the slopes where we all can meet. And the last one I would like to read is specifically for graduate students I'm teaching this semester. I'm teaching a course on brownness in Asian America. And this one's called Brown Commons. My skin, the river drags into the sea. My waist swells along the shore. The bluffs burn white, the scar. My palms valley. My toenails route returns in the soil, my body, this earth alive. We have a time for a couple more. I think we, yeah, we have time for some more. Um, any requests, Craig? Any audience requests? Or any Craig requests? Yes, you got to read the, the Kundiman poem. The Kundiman, yeah, that's right. Oops. Here you go. Kundiman for Patrick at White Alai. Dugan. At Victoria Park, I watched you erupt above the surface, hardening into an island. In Honolulu, you found Savai'i, and the Nihon you never thought you'd hear from beyond the dead. When the seabed grabbed your ankles, you let it wash you west. You'd fall in love with Edsa, the slow gray currents that carry the city around like river sludge. Or you'd meet our mother mountain, once a perfect cone, the smoking pencil scribbling native tales into the sky. Guga, when you see this poem, maybe Manila's screeching steel could by instinct fill your lungs with midland air. Or maybe you'd rustle in the fallen malungai, make believing the oak and birch of home, though incomplete, like love. And 
anymore. Uh, we got one in the Q&A, Dung Ao on page 16. All right. I read that already. I'm sorry, Jennifer. Yeah, you, you got to catch the, uh, you got to catch the early, um, the early video. There's a lot of Dung Ao though. Uh, Philippine studies. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. On a fresh week for rage, my father scattered open garbage cans across my bedroom floor. I had dreamed that I was back in the gig, sifting through sheet metal in the alley behind the quail egg stand. A rusty corrugated corner pierced a bag of rancid chicken before my eyes stung open from the same stench. Years before, leather lashed at my flesh and I reveried bloody knuckled ways to forgive each crack instead. I suppose that it was the rattan of alabaster nuns beating me through the father's wrist or the hooks whipping welts on the spine of Christ, raw repentance into clotting dirt dyed skin. When the lashes stopped new punishments, creative labors all sprung from his mind, guilt gilded yard work in the parish I never asked for. Lifelong labor taxes for the upkeep of the pastor indoors or this morning kitchen compost dispersed like us across my floor, the burden of sensing the homeland. Later that week, we gathered written scraps of property around the dining table to stitch into my parents' will. I inherited his freckles, but couldn't distinguish which came from father and which came from son. We have time for one short one. That may be a happy one if, there, if there's any of that in here. <laughs> Um, on Scarborough, page 64, on Scarborough, we blackened, browned, and yellowed valleys not our own. We mushroomed spores dispersed from patria to pools of blood that mingle native land kneading, stir-frying, pickling homelands into life, matsutakes in the clearing of Toronto's shrapnel, while mouths that cut their teeth on self-professing expertise scavenge between our fingers, insurgency, stealing stories on leathered skin. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I have my, thank you, Craig, for being in conversation always and, and into the future. Um, thank you to, the East Asian Studies Center, the Creativity Theory of Politics Research Cluster, um, the Center for Trans-Pacific Studies, um, and other folks who um, came to this event. Thank you for joining us across, I guess, the continent as well too, which I really appreciate. Um, and Doreen, I'll hand it to you for the conclusion. Um, well, I have nothing more to say than that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to you two for Thank this you. incredibly inspirational and beautiful um, hour together. And I'm so happy that we, amidst everything else that everyone is going through, have this moment to celebrate and experience, you know, joy and inspiration, um, thanks to the work of both of you. So we feel privileged. Um, and thank you all for coming. It was a lovely event, and we hope to see you at more. <laughs>